of this blood mine? Uh, never thought I had that much. Hello adventurers. Tonight we're going to be looking at Pathfinder Kingmaker, a game I've been meaning to play for a while. And with the release of the second game, Wrath of the Righteous, I thought there was no better time to play through Kingmaker. Pathfinder Kingmaker is an isometric RPG developed by Alcat Games, a Russian studio and funded via Kickstarter in 2017. Immediately in seeing the gameplay you can tell the inspirations for the game, the Baldur's Gate series and Neverwinter Nights. RPGs with a real-time with pause gameplay and an in-depth character development system with a range of classes, spells and feats to make yourself unique and make your characters play your way. But what is Pathfinder as a setting? In 2007, Dungeons & Dragons received a new edition, going from a well-loved 3.5th edition into 4th edition, an edition that, for the most part, was hated. It featured a really watered-down version of what D&D used to be and removed huge amounts of features in favour of making the game less complex and more accessible. The downside of this was that it spurned more experienced players in an attempt to garner new ones. Paizo, a company who had worked with Wizards of the Coast before, released the Pathfinder role-playing game, a game based on the 3.5th edition of Dungeons & Dragons and used very similar D20-based systems. Pathfinder, for a time, outperformed Dungeons & Dragons in sales and made its gap in the market. Kingmaker the Game is based on a series of adventure books of the same name, released by Paizo as an adventure campaign to supplement players of the game, and like all official Pathfinder releases, takes place on the world of Galarian. If you're a newcomer to tabletop RPGs, and have only ever played 4th or 5th edition of Dungeons & Dragons, and then have picked this game up, then you better strap yourself in kid, because it's going to be a bumpy ride. As you start the game, you're asked to choose a difficulty. The sheer amount of options you have to customise the difficulty is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's great to give me a huge amount of options to tailor my game. But a new player who hasn't touched a tabletop game, this could be quite confusing. Luckily, it seems they accounted for that by making a normal difficulty actually being slightly easier. You take less damage than you would on the tabletop, and the challenging difficulty is actually closer to a one-to-one -one portrayal of the tabletop game. You can change the difficulty mid-game, so I would just pick normal and then scale it to your liking as you play. After selecting your difficulty, we get to start a core feature of isometric RPGs, character creation. There's a good spread of fantasy races, as you'd expect, each with their own traits and stat benefits and flavour. Some races have more versatility than others, but that's just the nature of the game. If you're intending to make the strongest character possible, Tieflings and Azimar seem the most versatile, that is to say, the Devil Spawn and Angel Spawn races. There isn't a huge amount of physical customizations to make to your character's appearance, but that didn't bother me much as I'd rarely be able to see them close up. Instead, your character is represented by a portrait, which you can create and upload yourself really easily. The game features 16 classes, all of which have 4 subclasses that change how the class functions in a variety of ways. Using Cleric as an example, you have the base Cleric, which as you'd expect is a support based character who wears medium armour and can be survivable in combat. Then you have the Crusader, who gives up some ability with their support spells in order to gain Crusader feats, which allow you to take up heavy armour or specialise in weaponry you'd expect a fighter to use. Herald Caller, who again gives up some spell usage, but empowers their summoning spells, allowing you to summon more units and naturally increase their strength and health pools. And finally, the Ecclesi Theurge, who gives up wearing armour entirely in favour of being the ultimate support caster, improving and healing the whole party in a variety of ways. With 64 options to choose from, you'd be hard pressed to not have at least one subclass that you liked the idea and playstyle of. Additionally, there are 7 prestige classes to choose from, which are expanded classes that need a character to meet certain requirements before you can take them. Most of them seem to blend a couple of playstyles together, such as Arcane Trickster and Eldritch Knight being forms of a rogue wizard and a fighter wizard hybrid respectively. That's a huge range of classes and styles to choose from, and if you're like me, it's going to stop you in your tracks as your brain overloads with ideas and potential. Again, this is another double-edged sword, as the sheer volume of choice is great, but this would be to the newer player's ire. In fact, my knowledge of Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 helped me tremendously in figuring out what a lot of these subclasses were, and I can see it being quite difficult as a new player 
to get through the torrent of information in front of you. So, if you're new, I'd recommend Paladin, Sorcerer or Ranger, as each class has their own levels of versatility and are self-sufficient in a number of ways. Customization doesn't end here, of course. You have to add skill and ability points to determine what stats your character has and what they are good at, or at least what skill checks they are more likely to succeed in. The game has a nice indicator to suggest what stats you should consider and does well to explain what the stats are for when hovered over. And you can choose to specialise your skills, as the game will, generally, just use whoever has the highest skill in the party to perform the skill check. So you can pick your party member's skills specialties easily. You have a bard? Great, do persuasion. A fighter? Athletics is a natural choice there. And so on. Naturally, persuasion and perception are always good. Perception especially for finding hidden items in maps, which can usually net a good amount of gold early game. Next up we have feats, another way to further customise yourself, and even more tooltips to read. At this point you can see the theme behind character creation, tooltips and information dumps. To their credit, they have really tried to cut back on the amount of information that's dumped on you during the character creation, and only give you what you need, and the rest is in an encyclopedia in the main menu. A good starting feat most of the time is dodge, as improving your armour class makes you harder to hit. Finally, you have to pick an alignment. In a lot of games like this, oftentimes alignment doesn't have too much impact, but in Pathfinder there are dialogue options locked behind alignment, meaning if you're lawful, sometimes you'll have a lawful only dialogue, and if chaotic, there'll be some chaotic only dialogue. This also applies to the good, neutral and evil archetypes, so I would suggest choosing a theme for your character to get a rounded experience. I chose a lawful neutral magus for my first playthrough, and tried to stick to the lawful neutral mindset for the most part, rarely straying. As a result, I really felt the impact of my playthrough, and it provided me with a lot of satisfying moments. In my second playthrough, I went evil to test how the game coped with an evil character. You can play real time with pause or turn based. I tried to play both in my playthroughs, and ended up having a preference for turn based. Real time with pause is a more hands on experience, whereby you're managing your six party members whilst real time combat is happening, pausing to issue commands to your party. Whilst I did enjoy this style, I felt that perhaps this was due to my nostalgia from playing Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 growing up, which remains some of my favourite games to this day, but the experience in turn based felt right to me. It adds to that feel of tabletop game. With everything running out in turns, I was able to see my character development choices in action, rather than losing them in the mess of real time combat. I built my Magus to absolutely obliterate one target and left the AoE and cleave to other group members. In turn based I was able to watch my character destroy his target and feel that satisfaction behind my own choices. It's my understanding that turn based was added in far after the games released, and although I suffered a few bugs with turn based I can honestly say the game is significantly better with than without. As I say I did run into a few bugs using turn based, sometimes in bigger battles my FPS would tank down from a consistent 144 FPS to about 10% of that. It seemed to be related specifically to turn based, or if I switched turn based off, the FPS would be fine again. This could become frustrating, and would cause me some eye strain. In combat your party would make world or arcana skill checks against the creatures you're fighting, and if they succeed you can then hover over enemies to see their stats, what their resistances and their weaknesses were. This was a great way to show value in the skills that you were levelling. My biggest gripes in combat were with sneak attack and swarm units. There is no indicator in the game to tell you if your character will be sneak attacking or not. Whilst the game tells you that you need to be flanking a unit engaged with your party, there were times when my rogue and arcane trickster wouldn't get a sneak attack. A simple solution to this would have been to make the target highlight a different colour to confirm the sneak attack. Now swarms. Swarms are units that are a swarm of small creatures and move together as one unit. If they touch an enemy, they automatically do damage, and usually apply a poison or a disease of some kind. They are difficult to hit with conventional weapons, but AoE, flasks, bombs and spells all do bonus damage to make up for it. Even with that in mind, I felt like a lot of the swarm enemies I saw in the game seemed to be placed in areas just to spite me, and the game would be better off without them. Swarms are just tedious and boring. Whilst adventuring as the protagonist of the story, your character must be kept in the party but you can choose up to 5 other companions to be in your party at any given time, for a total of 6. You have 11 companions to find, recruit and choose from, which goes up to 12 if you include the DLC. Although the DLC character is more or less 2 companions, and there is one final secret companion that you can recruit if you meet the right criteria. 
If that's not enough, or you don't like the choice of your companions, you can always recruit mercenaries, who are essentially just companions that you create from the ground up, and are of course missing any in-game story. Each companion has their own story arc to be completed. Whilst all of them are short in essence, they are sprinkled across the whole game, and are well woven into the main storyline, and really do give a good insight into who your companions really are, and what their goals and hopes and dreams are. After completing the game, I looked up the list of companions, and I had missed two of my playthrough, which was surprising to me, as I thoroughly explored every map I came across, and it turned out I'd gone to maps at the wrong time, and was either too early or too late, and they were never to be seen again. Which I thought was peculiar, as I was the baron of the surrounding lands at the time, and if I missed a companion, I would have hoped that they would show up in my capital, and offer to join me there. Granted, I would have lost out on some of their story elements and purpose, but at least I still would have seen and interacted with them. Kingdom management is what you do in downtime, something you weave in between the main story, and it takes place on the kingdom map, which is where you'll spend a lot of your time during the game, as it's also used for travelling. The map is in the form of a fantasy map, and characters and objects are represented in these tabletop miniatures, which really evokes the idea that it is you, the player character, looking over a map and plotting your moves. As you begin, you exclusively use the map for travelling between locations, Whilst travelling, you can be waylaid by enemies, meet friendly travellers, or have mini events crop up, and each encounter is random. If it's an enemy, you can attempt to evade the encounter, which is really handy if you're trying to get somewhere in a hurry. However, this map mode really opens up when you claim your barony. Suddenly, you have to appoint advisors from a list of companions and acquaintances, no less. Don't worry, giving someone an advisor position doesn't stop them coming along with you on your adventures, but be careful with who you appoint. When Kingdom events happen, your advisors will, well, advise. However, if you've chosen an advisor whose own ambitions for the barony don't line up with yours, you will often ignore their advice. And if you do this too often, your advisor will step down from their role. So it's best to consider who you want in each position. As the barony opens up, you'll get cards appear in the tooltip. These cards will be problems, opportunities, research or upgrades. Problems will damage your kingdom if not dealt with, and opportunities will improve your kingdom if successful. Research will benefit your kingdom as well as open up some dialogue options, and upgrades will upgrade an advisor or your towns. As you claim more land, you can choose what to build in each of your territories. These buildings have stats attached to them and improve your kingdom. There are some buildings that have extra effects, such as the Mage Tower and Teleportation Circles, which, if you have built in a town, allows you to teleport in between them. And if the kingdom management isn't your bag, including the building, you can always switch kingdom management to automatically run itself in the options. Not only does this boil down to running your kingdom into its essential components nicely, it does give you the feel of progression, even in your downtime. Time being the operative word here. Time spent is relevant in Pathfinder. Some main story events will have totally different outcomes depending on the speed of which you do them. At the beginning when fighting to claim my barony, I succeeded in less than 30 in-game days, which gave me a powerful weapon. That is a very watered down version of the importance of time in this game. Moments are littered throughout this game that have the suggestion of haste being important, or having to choose which course of action to take first, with potentially devastating results in the event that you didn't prioritise. At my worst, I chose one companion over another, which resulted in the main villain getting the relic they had been after the entire game, and leaving me with well, nothing. I never found the relic in the end, and it altered the ending of my game. The dialogue is well written and maintains the fantastical element of the game. Interactions with fey creatures often have a whimsical delivery as you'd expect from creatures from another world. Companion dialogue is well crafted and informative. If you're inquisitive and ask questions, their dialogue does well to craft their backstory and invest you into it. I personally ended up very attached to what I considered my main group, and I never really wanted to change them out, even if it was to my detriment, and even then, there were companions I didn't take with me on adventures, but I interacted with them via the kingdom management as they held an advisor position, and I became attached to them that way, even to the point that in one instance I made an evil choice on my lawful neutral character, in order to keep a companion of mine alive, as if I didn't do that my whole kingdom would lose out on a talented minister. I made an evil choice for what I thought was the greater good. Throughout the game there are a huge amount of choices to make, exactly what you'd expect in an isometric RPG, 
Their bread and butter is plenty of miniature self-contained stories dusted over the cake that is the main storyline. So I took each event as they came, with little forethought on the future of these characters beyond the quest lines in question. So you'd imagine my surprise when Ivar the werewolf appeared in a tavern years after our first meeting, and, as I'd spared his life in the past, joined me in combat when the entire tavern turned out to be my enemies. Or when Zamas, a fey giant spider who I helped return home, appeared in the final act of the game to support their friend in their struggles. You really will feel the impact of your choices. There's even a moment towards the end where many of your allies come to your aid, and I have to admit it tugged at my heartstrings some when I started to see the procession of people that I'd helped in the past coming to return the favour. Even the kobolds and mites came. I cannot stress enough how well thought out and implemented the effects of your choices are. As you can tell by the in-game footage, the game is 3D rendered, like Pillars of Eternity or No Winter Nights. Whilst personally that isn't something I feel is necessary out of a game like this, I do think it's curious to make the game 3D in this manner, but then not allow the player to turn the camera angle of the game around. I understand the reasoning of budgeting being a factor, and fully rendering entire 3D landscapes is way more expensive than rendering the elements from one angle. But then personally I'd rather the game maintain a charming artistic style, and be more 2D or 2.5D landscapes. The maps themselves can vary though, some are plain as you'd expect, a field or a well travelled path with some trees around, but some maps just look fantastic. Their set design, especially on maps that use water, can look completely gorgeous. The 3D maps are accompanied by hand drawn backgrounds that appear frequently in the game, and these backgrounds are just completely beautiful, and in a style I favour greatly. You can see the care that has gone into the artist's strokes, and it's a simple way to actually emphasise the size of the landscapes that you're in. A great example of this is the viewing platform in your capital, that changes as time goes on, and you can see the village and the landscape being built up as you're expanding. As you travel, the maps can be afflicted by weather effects. This can be rain, heavy storms, thunder and lightning or snow, and each of these effects have some in-game impact but they look phenomenal and summon ideas that your adventurers are pushing through to their destination, no matter what surprises are waiting for them. The spells in this game are some of the best looking in any isometric RPG that I've played. Dimension Door looks fluid and snazzy, and you really feel the power emanating from AoE spells like Chain Lightning as it bolts between your enemies. The sound in this game is really compelling. In combat, spells sound really heavy and powerful when they hit, Phantasmal Illusion plays an ominous chime noise along with the animation, but a spell that instantly kills on a failed save is always going to be satisfying. The sound definitely does compound the experience though. In melee your weapons really have feel and they connect with satisfying weighty thunks and slashes. There is a good range of musical pieces in this game, and Alcat managed to get in on Zer to create some of the tracks, including the main theme. And I'm sure many of you know Inon Zer for his unforgettable music on Power Rangers Turbo and Beetleborgs, as well as some of these lesser known games. The main theme is grandiose and has a regal, authoritative feeling with strong brass instruments and ties in nicely with the overarching idea of being the figurehead and leader of your own barony or kingdom. Although this music was great, the music that had the most impact on me was the more folky music, something that I've always loved anyway. A portion of these were performed by an artist named Dryante, who has played every instrument in the piece, and they are crafted with a lot of passion, and that carries right through into the game. I'm going to play a segment now, and then I'll link their YouTube in the description. If you like the music, you should definitely check them out. The story of this game naturally changes depending on the choices you make. You will certainly have a different experience of the story if you make all evil choices than if you'd made all good choices. Kingmaker is essentially six self-contained stories, with the final seventh chapter tying things together as you deal with the big bad of the game. The game starts in a mansion. You, along with a large group of other adventurers and mercenaries, are told that you've been called together to kill a bandit king who has a hold on a local area. If you succeed, your reward will be the lands he has a hold over your very own barony. The mansion is attacked, and you fight your way out, meeting some companions along the way, including one who seems highly suspicious by the name of Tartuccio. After fighting off the attack on the mansion, it is clear that one of the adventurers was a spy. Tartuccio slanders you and claims that you must be the spy, 
What's your shawl at the spy's tattoo show? Other parties unable to identify the spy, you are then split into two adventuring parties. You lead one, whilst Tartuccio the other. You are let out into the world, or at least into a part of the world called the Stolen Lands. Now you must work to find and defeat the Bandit King, whilst also trying to stop Tartuccio from whatever they are trying to achieve. And you can choose which one to focus on more, but ultimately you deal with both. Tartuccio is looking for something, a relic or a unique item of great power. When you try to stop him, you find other companions for your party. Typically, he has used them and then abandoned them as and when they lost their use. Whilst following lead to the Bandit King, you stumble across a faction of kobolds and mites who are warring with one another. The war was started by Tartuccio, who has used illusion magic to appear as a kobold shaman named Tartuk. Tartuccio abuses this to find the relic he was looking for, and when you finally catch him, you are too late and the relic is gone, but you are quick enough to catch Tartuccio and deal with him. In your travels, you are constantly hindered by an impenetrable fog across the stolen lands that only seems to be growing. But in your dreams, a nymph reaches out to you saying she is the guardian of the lands and gives you guidance on where to go in order to lift the fog and find the Bandit King. You find and kill the Bandit King, return to the mansion victorious and you are made the Baron or Baroness of the lands that you liberated. You travel back to your new capital and are greeted by the nymph you had seen in your dreams, offering you a reward for saving the area but it is bait and you are lured into an ambush. The nymph reveals himself to be a villain of some sort. You escape the ambush and go back to your capital. Quickly it becomes apparent that there is an unnatural troll presence plaguing your newly formed barony, and some trolls even appear to have a brand on their skin that renders them immune to fire damage, something that is typically known to be one of the best methods for defeating the troll's extreme regeneration ability. You investigate and find that the branded trolls originate from an old dwarven fortress that was thought to be an abandoned ruin. Instead, it has been taken over by a troll kobold alliance and the fortress claimed as their headquarters, called Trobold. Trobold is led by Troll King Hargalka and a kobold named Tartuk. Although you killed him previously, he appears to have been resurrected. You get the attacks to stop either through diplomacy or hostility. A few months to a year later, your barony is subject to a mysterious plague where infected citizens feel ill and then spontaneously and explosively transform into monsters. Through research you discover that actually it isn't a disease and citizens have been somehow swallowing seeds which stay in the victim's stomach until ready and when ready, open a portal that brings in a creature from another world. But as the portal is in the victim's stomach, they explode into a red mist as the creature comes through. You find the source is a huge fey flower that exists both in your world and the fey world. You split the party in order to burn both flowers simultaneously, the only way to permanently destroy the threat. Whilst in the Fey world, you are given more of an insight into the nymph guardian and her origins. It becomes clear that a Fey god punished the nymph, who is named Nyrissa, for trying to set up her own kingdom, and as a part of her punishment, she must now destroy 1,000 kingdoms. After succeeding to destroy the flower, the barony returns to normal. After a time of peace, you receive a letter from a barony neighbouring your own named Varnhold, asking for your help. You notice that Varnhold is entirely empty, there is nothing around except for a strange raven that seems to follow and taunt you. Exploring the local area, you find some barbarians who are being led by the mysterious defaced sisters. These women are looking for some ancient artifacts in the local area, but many of the sisters have not returned. You leave and gather knowledge on the defaced sisters and return with news to the barbarians. The sisters that are present try and convince the barbarians to kill you. From this, you learn of the existence of Vordekai, an ancient cyclops lich who is behind the vanishing of Varnhold. After defeating the lich and his raven pet, you take over as the rule of the lands of Varnhold, adding them to your barony. Returning home, you find out that a neighbouring area is under attack by barbarians, and this area is the same place where you started, in the mansion, and therefore you have some responsibility to help. The defaced sisters are behind this as well and they have convinced the barbarian leader that he is the embodiment of an ancient hero. After resolving the barbarian invasion, you are made a king or queen as a result. The neighbouring kingdom of Pitax invites you to a tournament. Although the tournament in itself is not suspicious, Tartuccio was an agent of Pitax and its king. Going to the tournament anyway, you meet the ruler of Pitax, Iroveti, who, well, just listen. So here's the plan. First, the fish is Priapalon, 
then a boasting contest. And in the evening, the best part, <laughs> a drunken melee. In the interim, there'll be a buffet, a fair, jugglers, acrobats, all the usual entertainment. And after the melee, I'll announce the winner. And then we'll have a festive banquet and a fireworks show. <laughs> then we just drink till morning or find a tent to crawl into. Your own or someone else's, depending on your luck. By the way, a knockout such as yourself will always be welcome in my tent. <laughs> just joking. Just a joke. <laughs> That's their ruler. Promptly after the tournament, Irovetti launches a propaganda war against you. It is revealed that Nyrissa the Nymph only needs two more kingdoms to achieve her thousand. Irovetti knows of her and is her pawn. As are you. This entire time you've been destroying kingdoms and adding to the one thousand. Irovetti reveals to you that the artifact Tartuccio found all that time ago was something the Fey God the Lantern King took from Nyrissa. Her capacity to love, which manifested as an artifact called the Briar. The Briar, after defeating Irovetti, is now in your hands. You are now the last kingdom in the Stolen Lands, and the last Nyrissa needs to get her 1000. Nyrissa responds with an all-out assault on the kingdom. You travel to the Feyworld and defeat Nyrissa, but upon defeating her you have destroyed Nyrissa's own kingdom, and thus the 1000th kingdom needed. The big bad, the Lantern King, reveals himself as having been a guiding hand behind everything that has happened so far and brings the whole kingdom into the Fey world. You gather your companions for a showdown against the Lantern King, which can end in a variety of ways and changes the ending drastically. I've tried to leave out too much detail so you may experience it for yourself. On top of this there are all of the side quests, companion stories and kingdom management events which are, in many ways, their own self-contained stories. There's even a side quest created by a Kickstarter backer that comes right out of the RPG Horror Story subreddit in which the player runs into a character that is a complete self-insert into the world, who is highly attractive, a scoundrel, a renegade, amazing at everything, clearly better than you, and edgy enough to have a contract with his own demon sugar daddy. Luckily, you can just kill them. Overall, the game has its bugs and some moments that feel stretched out in the story, and perhaps could have used some trimming in some areas. But there is an evident amount of passion put into the game, and the amount of choices that you can make as a player that actually have an impact are fantastic. In all games like this you'll be able to find some questionable good and evil decisions, and Pathfinder has a fair few of those, but the playthrough is genuinely fun and doesn't attempt to force you to like the companions you get. In some cases, I didn't like the companions as I met them and then they grew on me over time. There are times whilst playing that I noticed small changes in the game environment as a reaction to events as they were unfolding and I always took some time to appreciate these. Like when the Capitals Tavern added a nice owlbear rug after I had killed a giant owlbear not that long before. Neat touches like that can go a long way. I have a lot of praise for the kingdom management system as something that I just really enjoyed and the variety of advisors you can find in this game is brilliant, with the game even accounting for players who want to play as evil. The game can suffer from long load times as you play. This can get so bad that people have put mods out specifically designed to speed up your game by clearing out the trash loot left behind on maps, but I never experienced frustrating load times in either of my playthroughs. Speaking of mods, the love the players have for Pathfinder is clear. Mods exist that add in many more of the classes from the tabletop and have their own fixes for elements of the game that aren't up to scratch. Ultimately, if you know nothing about Dungeon Dragons 3.5th edition or Pathfinder as a tabletop game, some might say don't get this game. I'd say the opposite. If you're interested in the tabletop, you can use Kingmaker as a great tool for giving you an understanding of the basics of the tabletop and the options that you have. The game is a great experience, warts and all, and it is absolutely worth the £15 it is charged for on Steam. For that £15, you'll get easily 70 to 100 hours of play in one playthrough of the main game. The DLCs bring in some added costs, but they are totally unnecessary to experiencing the game. Have you played through Pathfinder already? If so, let me know in the comments how you found it. And if you enjoyed the video, please take a moment to like and subscribe, it helps me greatly. That's all I have for this evening. Good night.